Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of Prince Caspian by C.S. Lewis. So this is book number four in the Chronicles of Narnia series. If you go chronologically, which is the order in which the box set that I got goes. A prince fights for his crown. A prince denied his rightful throne gathers an army in a desperate attempt to rid his land of a false king. But in the end it is a... Biggie! But in the end it is a battle of honour between two men alone that will decide the fate of an entire world. So... After I read The Horse and His Boy, book number three, I gave that a two out of five and hated it. And I was really reluctant to carry on with the series. So I actually put this as a bedtime book and read the first 25 pages of it before bed. And it was like, oh, actually, actually, actually it's pretty good. So, uh, so I stuck with it. And uh, I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs throughout. I did actually have my tabs in bed, so my first note I did make in bed. They're still in our world, I believe, at the moment. And uh, they're off on a little adventure already. And uh, they decided to build a fire. They had great difficulty in lighting it and used a lot of matches, but they succeeded in the end. Finally, all four sat down with their backs to the wall and their faces to the fire. They tried roasting some of the apples on the ends of sticks, but roast apples are not much good without sugar, and they are too hot to eat with your fingers till they are too cold to be worth eating. So they had to content themselves with raw apples, which, as Edmund said, made one realise that school suppers weren't so bad after all. I shouldn't mind a good thick slice of bread and margarine this minute, he added. So for a start, what kind of reprobate school kids are going around with matches in their pockets? What is a roast apple? Because I've not heard of that. And what is wrong with just apples? We get a mention to the gifts that the kids received in the first book. Uh, so they say, we must take the gift, said Peter. For long ago, at Christmas in Narnia, he and Susan and Lucy had been given certain presents which they valued more than their whole kingdom. Edmund had had no gift because he was not with them at the time. This was his own fault, and you can read about it in the other book. Yeah, he was being a little bit of a dick at the time, wasn't he? And they met Santa. Chapter 3, the dwarf here, it starts, uh, The worst of sleeping out of doors is that you wake up so dreadfully early. And when you wake, you have to get up because the ground is so hard that you are uncomfortable. And it makes matters worse if there is nothing but apples for breakfast and you have had nothing but apples for supper the night before. Yeah, that's like being at Glastonbury. I've been there and you wake up with a really bad hangover and you've got nothing to drink and you can't move and the sun's beating down and it's like quarter past seven in the morning. And you're like, oh, oh I was up until 4am. And now we get a bit of an explanation here, I guess. See, in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, they went to Narnia, went home for a few weeks and then went back again. And it was kind of the same time in Narnia. Whereas in this one, they've gone back to Narnia and it's hundreds of years later. So it's some sort of time dilation-y effect here. I still don't believe that C.S. Lewis ever... Or at least I'm on book, finished book five now, and he's not satisfactorily explained the way that time works in Narnia to me yet. But what, whatever. So, uh, so Edmund says, You know what we were puzzling about last night? That it was only a year ago since we left Narnia, but everywhere looks as if no one had lived in Care Paravel for hundreds of years. Well, don't you see... You know that however long we seem to have lived in Narnia, when we got back through the wardrobe it seemed to have taken no time at all. Go on, said Susan. I think I'm beginning to understand. And that means, continued Edmund, that once you're out of Narnia, you have no idea how Narnian time is going. Why shouldn't hundreds of years have gone past in Narnia while what only one year has passed for us in England? Well, I would answer that, Edmund, because when you left Narnia for two weeks, two weeks passed in Narnia. I mean, by this rate of time dilation, one year becomes a hundred years, Two weeks becomes 200 weeks, which is about four years. You should have gone back four years later. So they meet this dwarf and they rescue him, actually. Susan shoots somebody in the head with an arrow, but it just bounces off their helmet. Seems to happen a lot. I think somebody else gets shot in the head by an arrow and he just bounces off their helmet and they're fine. So the dwarf thinks they're ghosts and Lucy says, but why should we be ghosts? I've been told all my life, said the dwarf, that these woods along the shore were as full as ghosts. I've been told all my life, said the dwarf that these woods along the shore were as full of ghosts as they were of trees. That's what the story is. And that's why, when they want to get rid of anyone, they usually bring him down here, like they were doing with me, and say they'll leave him to the ghosts. But I always wondered if they didn't really drown him or cut their throats. I never quite believed in the ghosts. But those two cowards you've just shot believed all right. They were more frightened of taking me to my death than I was of going. And then we've got this little, uh, this little bit during a history lesson here, so... No men, or very few, lived in Narnia before the Telmarines took it, said Dr. Cornelius. Then who did my great-great-grandcestors conquer? Whom? Not who, your highness, said Dr. Cornelius. Perhaps it is time to turn from history to grammar. And then uh, Dr. Cornelius gives this thing to uh, Prince Caspian. And he says, he put, it, he put in Caspian's hand something which he could hardly see, but which he knew by the feel to be a horn. That, said Dr. Cornelius, 
is the greatest and most sacred treasure of Narnia. Many terrors I endured, many spells did I utter to find it when I was still young. It is the magic horn of Queen Susan herself which she left behind her when she vanished from Narnia at the end of the Golden Age. It is said that whoever blows it shall have strange help. No one can say how strange. It may have the power to call Queen Lucy and King Edmund and Queen Susan and High King Peter back from the past, and they will set all to rights. It may be that it will call up Aslan himself. Take it, King Caspian, but do not use it except at your greatest need. And now, haste, haste, haste! The little door at the very bottom of the tower, the door into the garden, is unlocked. There, we must part. We get some incredibly named characters here. The badger was called Truffle Hunter. He was the oldest and kindest of the three. The dwarf who had wanted to kill Caspian was a sour black dwarf. That is, his hair and beard were black, and thick and hard like horsehair. His name was Nickerbrick. The other dwarf was a red dwarf with hair rather like a fox's, and he was called Trumpkin. So basically, we've got Truffle Hunter, who's on the magic mushrooms. We've got Nickerbrick, who is a casual thief. And then we have Trumpkin, who is the president of the United States. What a trio. And then we have this conversation. You make me sick, Badger, growled Nickerbrick. The High King Peter and the rest may have been men, but they were a different sort of men. This is one of the cursed Telmarines. He has hunted beasts for sport, haven't you now? He added, rounding suddenly on Caspian. Well, to tell you the truth, I have, said Caspian. But they weren't talking beasts. Oh, oh, that's okay then, is it? I said, I'm gonna go and hu I'm gonna go and hunt down some fucking mutes. And it won't be, it'll be fine, it won't be murder, because they're, they're not talking humans. And then we get to this bit here where the story comes a bit full circle. Great Scott, said Peter. So it was the horn, your own horn, Sue, that dragged us all off that seat on the platform yesterday morning. I can hardly believe it, yet it all fits in. And it's, it's funny because they compare it to like the Arabian Nights and when you summon a djinn, and the djinn has to come into our world, and they were like, well, this is the opposite though. We're being summoned from our world to go somewhere else. And then we have this uh, shooting competition with the arrows between Trumpkin and Susan. Uh, they tossed up for the first shot, greatly to the interest of Trumpkin, who had never seen a coin toss before, and Susan lost. They were to shoot from the top of the steps that led from the hall into the courtyard. Everyone could see from the way the dwarf took his position and handled his bow that he knew what he was about. Twang! went the string. It was an excellent shot. The tiny apple shook as the arrow passed, and a leaf came fluttering down. Then Susan went to the top of the steps and strung her bow. She was not enjoying her match half so much as Edmund had enjoyed his. Not because she had any doubt about hitting the apple, but because Susan was so tender-hearted that she almost hated to beat someone who had been beaten already. The dwarf watched her keenly as she drew the shaft to her ear. A moment later, with a little soft thump which they could all hear in that quiet place, the apple fell to the grass with Susan's arrow in it. So I guess now we're borrowing from like Robin Hood and William Tell. I also like this bit here, the dwarf's wounded, and Lucy goes, Oh, are you wounded? Do let me look. It's not a sight for little girls, began Trumpkin. But then he suddenly checked himself. There I go, talking like a great fool again, he said. I suppose you're as likely to be a great surgeon as your brother was to be a great swordsman or your sister to be a great archer. He sat down on the steps and took off his hauberk and slipped down his little shirt, showing an arm hairy and muscular, in proportion, as a sailor's, though not much bigger than a child's. There was a clumsy, ban there was a clumsy bandage on the shoulder which Lucy proceeded to unroll. Underneath, the cut looked very nasty, and there was a good deal of swelling. Oh, poor Trumpkin, said Lucy. How horrid. Well, if he is the present, just leave it. It'll go gangrenous. Be fine. So she has to use uh, some of her, like, drops that she's got in her little flask. Okay, well apparently I lost the end of the footage for this review, but that's pretty much all I wanted to mention. Anyway, there were a few other bits I was going to say, but hey-ho, I've like taken the tabs out of the book now, so I can't remember the page references or anything. But anyway, as always, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book, and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.